All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first edition of our 2023 SEBRA webinar series, or as we call them, SEBRANARS. My name is Richard Kane. I'm the Principal Director of the Innovation, Legislation, Education and Research Branch in the Biosecurity Strategy and Reform Division here in DAF. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet here today. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, and for me, here in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city, and I extend that recognition to the traditional custodians of all other lands on which our staff and participants are gathered here today. And indeed, to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending today's seminar. Before we start, um, just for everyone else that has joined in, Professor Robertson here is going to be um, uh, presenting, but please keep your cameras off and mute your mics. If you've got any questions as they pop through, we will allow time. I'll try and keep Andrew on time here so that um, we can have um, some questions at the end. To those that we're asking, it is being recorded as well, and there'll be the, uh, you'll be able to replay them later on as well. Um, there is the virtual hands up option as well, so you can either write your questions in the chat field or pop your hand up at the end and uh, we'll, we'll moderate those as we go through. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, the Centre for, uh, of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis or SEBRA is a long standing biosecurity research initiative and plays a vital role in providing the Australian and New Zealand governments with expert biosecurity risk analysis and advice that helps inform a range of biosecurity risk management activities. As I flagged before, we've got Professor Andrew Robertson here with us today, who is the CEO and Chief Investigator at SEBRA, and who is presenting on SEBRA's approach to creating risk-based probability models. Andrew is no stranger to the SEBRA NAR series. He has a PhD in forestry and a master's in statistics from the Uni of Minnesota, and is currently professor in applied statistics at the University of Melbourne. Andrew is an elected member of the International Stati Statistical Institute and has published four books, over 90 research articles, and 50 ACERA, it's going back a while, and separate technical reports on various aspects of risk analysis and biosecurity. I hope I mentioned everything there, Andrew. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Andrew. Just a quick reminder to everyone who has just joined, cameras off, mute your, your microphones, and uh, we'll moderate those questions and we'll give you plenty of time to ask them at the end. Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rich. I really appreciate that. Uh, folks, um, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm going to share my screen. And some some uh, response that I've done that successfully would be welcome. Yes, no. Thank you. Yep, we can see that. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, as Rich mentioned, I'm Andrew Robinson. I'm the CEO slash director of SEBRA. And uh, we spend our time working with the Australian and New Zealand governments and, and other jurisdictional governments thinking about biosecurity risk. Today, I'm not really going to talk about biosecurity risk. I'm going to, I'm going to do a little a bit of a, a, side, a side jump into a related area which we engaged in over the last couple of years to, um, to different, er different kinds of risks and different thinking about risks. And I want to bring these back to think about how they may inform how we think about biosecurity risks. This was work done by, um, by well, by SEBRA with Defence. It, it was a very collaborative effort, um, particularly Judge Ingell, who's um, my co-author on the presentation and, and may even be available for questions. I don't know. Uh, and <clears throat> it, it was about um, how we estimate and consequently manage uh, risks of, of threats against high value assets. So, so where do we go from here and what does that teach us about biosecurity? That's what the next little while is about. Let's see if I've got everything it takes to make the slides advance. There we go. All right, so the question that I put in front of you is how do we assess the risk of very rare but catastrophic threats to valued assets? So we're thinking about, I, I picked two assets here. Um, uh, we're not actually going to think about the threats to these assets. And I have to say, I did have to hunt 
for quite a while to find a picture of the MCG that looked quite as good or nearly as good as the picture of the Sydney Opera House, just for balance. Um, what would you what would you think about if we were challenged to think about risks to these valued assets and the the the, the value that they present to society and uh, the possibility that at various times they house large numbers of people? Um, what would the considerations be? How would you go about constructing some kind of decision support framework or model? that would provide insight uh, into the potential threats and the risks and and how this might be mitigated uh, that's that's the kind of i want frame i frame the presentation with these questions because i can't actually tell you what we actually did so instead i'm just going to use lots of illustrative examples so that's the that's the motivating question think about the mcg think about the sydney opera house what are the vulnerabilities and what has to happen for those vulnerabilities to potentially be exploited? And what might that mean for uh, how you may manage those risks? So the traditional way to think about this kind of stuff is encoded in ISO 31000, and that provides lovely principles and guidelines for risk management. And that that's led to a standardized approach to security risk assessment. And the common approach to getting a security risk assessment typically has been you find a consultant who used to work in the same organization uh, who now wears a corduroy jacket with leather with with leather patches on the elbows and smokes a pipe uh, and has gray hair and huge gravitas and you pay them a lot of money and they come along to your organization and they point with point at various things with their pipe and they mutter various things and then they produce a report that that is basically the same way the organization has thought for the past couple of decades. Um, and that proved to be an unappetizing prospect to our friends in defense. They wanted to, to try to look at these problems differently. They wanted to think about whether there were different approaches and perhaps more quantitative approaches to solving these problems, these, these, these impossible problems. Um, so they framed this problem as, well, we've got a, a complex security environment. We don't know what events are occurring or how often they occur. And they want to know how effective, therefore, their controls were against very unlikely events. And ISO 31000 doesn't provide a lot of insight to these kinds of things. So they wanted something new, something that was not wearing a corduroy jacket. And, and I don't have one of them. So that was a good start. So the way that defense chose to think about this, encouraged by us and supported by us, is to think about attack paths, which describe sequences of events that have to have occurred in order for a threat to become a reality. So they they thought about what are the various what are the various steps in the necessary process that have to occur and codified them and wrote them down and then essentially created a flow diagram of disaster, which is what you see in front of you, uh, that looks at what has, how many things have to fail in order, and what are they, what are they called and who's in charge of them uh, in order for an attack to succeed. So it's, it's like a, a, a counterfactual narrative, essentially. And then they thought, well, that's, that's, that's the starting point. That's the that's the model. That that's what's going to happen. Now, how do we get numbers for that? And that, of course, is where difficulty is introduced. Um, I'm going to add. I'm going to first of all. I'm going to say yeah, that I'm I'm an applied statistician, my friends. And where I come from, there's only two ways to get data: the right way and the not quite right way. The right way is experiment. You design experiment. You specify your hypotheses, you, you carry out your experiment, you do your statistics, you draw your conclusion. And then the not quite right way is you do an observational study. Well, OK, sometimes you can't do experiments because they're unethical, for example. But you could you could watch you could you could watch people in the street and see how they behave, for example. And sadly, for these kinds of tail events we're describing, design experiments don't really work uh, and observational studies would be rather slow. 
because uh, we're thinking about things that may not happen once in a hundred years. Um, and uh, I don't know whether I don't know whether our friends in defence would have been entirely happy waiting that long to get an answer to the question. Oh, plus, uh, for observational study to work, you've got to see the kind of event that you would really rather not see. So there's a there's almost like a, a, a tragic tension in observational studies associated with managing these high level risks. So that was ruled out as well. So we need to find data from somewhere. And I, I want to add in passing that I, I tried to find a nice uh, icon that would capture experiment. And it is indicative of the impoverishment of common understanding of what experiments are, that this is this is like the first 10 icons and they all involve test tubes. So I don't know what that tells us about what Google thinks about science, but it doesn't seem good. All right, so back to the point. We, we want data, um, we can't do an experiment, and we can't do an observational study. Clearly then, it's futile and we should stop. So not true, of course. Um, I want to quote uh, uh, a person whom I somewhat idolize. He was actually not that nice of a person, so I don't really idolize him, but but gosh, he said some smart stuff. And the, the thing that uh, John Tukey was an American statistician, um, died in about 2000. Um, he invented, for nerds amongst us, uh, Tukey invented the fast Fourier transform. So if you've ever done any analysis of, of spectral data or time series data or sometimes spatial data, or if you've ever done some decomposition, you've used Tukey's tools. And so for that, he is immense. But the thing that I want to invoke that he said, which I think is super important in this setting, is it's better to solve the right problem approximately than the wrong problem exactly. And so what that means is, and how we how we how we instantiate that is you write down the right model, the model that actually captures the problem as you understand it, and the model that gives you levers so you can understand what will be the consequences of decisions that you take. That's the model that you that you use to represent your problem. And then you collect data to make that model work, to figure out what the values are for the tuning knobs, et cetera. We call that parameterize. So to parameterize the model with, with the best data you have, but you don't compromise on the model simply because you don't have the data. That's the key here. You don't fit the wrong model simply because you can. You fit the right model and you answer the questions as best you can with the best data available. So how do we do that? So in SEBRA, we use a process called structured expert judgment. Now, I have been a structured expert judgment skeptic for the past, gonna say, well, previous 10 years. And I've only recently seen the light to say, uh, gosh, sometimes the data you get just aren't satisfactory, but the questions are still really important. So structured expert judgment is the approach that we advocate to help you answer the right question approximately. We use a protocol that was developed by ACIRA a number of years ago. The pro protocol is named IDEA, which stands for investigate, discuss, estimate, and aggregate. And I would happily deliver an entire seminar on idea and its strengths and weaknesses, but I'm just going to brush over it because you can read all about it in other places. Or you can invite me back. The key aspects to making the idea protocol work are that you have to have a diverse group of experts. There has to be general agreement on the definitions of words and, and on the implications of the definitions of words and on the units of measurement. It involves a discussion that needs to be robust and balanced, but the discussion does not need to lead to consensus. In fact, the idea of consensus is anathema to idea. Sorry, a bit of a dad joke there. Um, the principle of consensus is anathema to idea. Um, we want to capture and understand the variability of opinion. We don't want to smother it. And it, requires and then delivers a, a sincere expression of uncertainty, which is, as you'll see in the slides to come, incredibly powerful. 
It also requires careful data analysis, which is which is where we shine. Um, the discussions have the advantage of bringing otherwise hidden assumptions to the surface. Uh, oftentimes, just by getting groups of people that think differently about the world but don't know it, talking to one another, and then coming to realization that, oh, you know what, I think that this is true and they think that is true and we're probably all wrong. But regardless, it becomes it becomes obvious. It also provides a, a critical record of relevant facts that can then be deployed in subsequent modeling exercises or even for explaining and contextualizing the results. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And oftentimes, what happens when you have a sufficiently diverse group is that there's almost always somebody who feels like they don't belong. And they almost always ask a question they think is stupid. And that question almost always cracks open the problem in an interesting way. So diversity plays two key roles. Firstly, it provides a warrant that you're going to get better results. And we've got experimental results that demonstrate that diverse groups outperform narrow groups. But also, Diverse thinking provides different ways of knowing, and that is key in this and so many other settings. So diversity of all kinds is highly valuable in a structured expert judgment setting, as in real life. Um, and the phrase that I would like you to carry away, um, maybe from today, is it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So structured expert judgment, you know, we are the first to say, oh, it's not as good as real data, but maybe the real data will cost you millions or take you years to collect. What will you do in the meantime? What else can you do other than deploy your experts the best way you can, capture the uncertainty as best you can, and then make your choice? There's nothing else. So we advocate this most firmly. The idea protocol, I'm going to accelerate a little bit on this because I recognize that with my rambling, I'm running out of time already. Um, the idea protocol is designed to minimize rather than avoid cognitive frailties. And the cognitive frailties that we mark and that we uh, guard against are things like framing. Um, so we ask the questions very carefully. Uh, availability, we try to manage the, um, the information very carefully. Anchoring and adjustment, again, um, anchoring can be good and can be bad, uh, depending on how it's used. Uh, and overconfidence, uh, which is almost always bad. No, I'll say it's always bad. Um, and uh, that's actually got intersectional threads because we have found strong evidence that is backed up by previous studies that um, the most overconfident of all experts are old white males like me, uh, and the least overconfident uh, young females. Um, so that needs to be taken account of in the analysis uh, of the results. We also want to watch out for group frailties, such as groupthink, whereby judgments are affected by a group's unwitting desire to be nice to each other. Uh, and dominance, um, where a group tends to lean their opinion in the direction of a person uh, whom they believe to be uh, authoritative. Um, uh, see earlier note about grey white males. Uh, and um, halo effects, uh, well, I guess which are also related to the dominance. Um, so we try to avoid or minimise the impacts of all these cognitive frailties uh, through the idea protocol. Um, and lots of lots of papers about that and happy to chat about that at uh, another time or in question time if there's time. So here's an example of a question that is amenable to structured expert judgment. Um, will foot and mouth disease arrive in Australia? Um, uh, Sebra undertook indeed a, a structured expert judgment exercise on behalf of uh, DAF a, a, a year ago and, and before then to try to get a sense of the urgency of uh, deploying border measures for preventing the entry of foot and mouth disease uh, in the heightened threat environment that was brought about by the arrival of the foot and mouth disease in Indonesia. 
and um, the results are in the public domain. I'm not going to talk about those, but what I want to I want to raise this as an example of a question that you, you can't really do a designed experiment and you can't really do an observational study, uh, but you've got to do something. You know you've got to do something. So um, structure expert judgment provides you with that candle. But the other cool thing that comes out of it because of the discussion is the safety factors. And um, these are described here on the uh, on the slide. And one that is quite material uh, was that the experts, you may, those of you who are familiar with the results may recall that the experts did not consider foot and mouth disease to be substantially more risky, not substantially more risky than it had been previously, uh, despite the arrival uh, of the virus in um, foot and mouth in, in uh, Indonesia, um, because and the experts felt it was not, it was because Australia had already hardened its borders uh, to arrivals from Indonesia on account of lumpy skin disease being in Indonesia. And of course, those vectors are not identical, um, but the experts considered that the heightened threat environment meant that activities that you would ordinarily have to undertake um, may already be being undertaken. And that that contextual information came up in the con in the con in, in the discussion, and that was super powerful for helping explain the results. So here's an example of a structured expert judgment question. Um, I'm picking this neutral and and largely anonymous player of Australian rules football, Mr. Max Gorn. Um, I want you to I'm just going to walk you through this process. Um, imagine a thousand instances in which Max Gorn is lining up to kick a goal. In Australian rules football, for those of us uh, who are in New Zealand, like me, uh, from more than 50 meters out, directly in front of the goalposts. Now, I want you to imagine unspecified circumstances that would make you pessimistic about his chances to score a goal. For example, he could be tired, it could be wet, there could be a crosswind or a headwind, the ball could be damp, heavy, all these factors. Think about all. Or he could be he could be um, carrying an ankle injury. Um, Pessimistically, in how many of the thousand instances does he manage to score a goal? So you think about all the factors that make you pessimistic. And then I want you to imagine unspecified circumstances that make you optimistic about his chances to score a goal. For example, he could have just come on the field after a rest. It might be a beautiful Melbourne day, uh, or there could be a tailwind, the ball is dry, um, uh, the team is about to lose if he doesn't get the goal, etc. So now optimistically, thinking optimistically, how many of those thousand instances does he score a goal? And then finally, you take account of all the reasons to be optimistic and pessimistic, and you mix them all together in your head, and you pick your best guess. So that's that's a structured expert judgment question that that follows, that that is used um, following the idea protocol. Uh, and I, I hope you all, uh, in, in question time, I'll be interested to hear what your answers are. Uh, okay. So in, after we've done this process, we then capture the experts' opinions. Um, and sometimes the experts all work together at the same time, and sometimes they're uh, distributed, and sometimes they work in clusters, uh, and sometimes they work as individuals. So there's all different kinds of ways of capturing uh, that and codifying that information, but it all has to be aggregated. And the key is that when you have a complex model, such as the model of the attack path that we saw in an earlier slide, you aggregate late. And what I mean by that is you calculate those attack paths expert by expert, and then you mush them all together at the end. Um, because that otherwise you create the problem of, of uh, correlations between experts' responses that can uh, mislead you. So, um, Here's how this played out in the attack path setting that I described. The first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to get a sense of how often an attack path might be exploited, how many attempts there might be. Now, now um, this is uh, the way we handled that is, is, is by a little device. Um, we said, imagine you're writing the 100 year history of this, of this um, valued resource. And in how many times, and, and the, the threat level, the environmental threat level has been the same for that 100 years. Just imagine that. We're all, we're, how often do you think that attack path has been attempted when you're writing 
this history. So we put people into that counterfactual state. Now, here's an example of how you might do this in the Max Gorn setting. You're writing his biography and you're about to write down the number of how many shots of goal he took from 50 meters directly in front. And we go through that same process. Imagine unspecified circumstances that make you pessimistic about his chance to kick goals. For example, he could be off the off the ground. He could be moved to a different part of the ground. He could have retired early, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So pessimistically, how many shots at goal will he have had in his career? And then imagine unspecified circumstances that make you optimistic about his chance to kick goals. For example, he's had a long career. Um, he may be shifted to a fence permanently, and changes downfield might improve the, the 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 football pipeline. Okay, optimistically. How many shots at goal does he get in his career? The same principles apply. And then we do the be optimistic and be pessimistic at the same time. What's the best guess? So that gives us an inkling about how many times Max tries to kick a goal or how many times an, an attack path is, is, uh, is attempted to be exploited. And you could break that down further, right? So we've, we've picked a very specific um, lens there. But in, in, the, in the Gorn case, again, you could say how many games do you think he plays and how many shots of goal does he get per game? It might be easier, and this is key, it might be easier for experts to think about the shots at goal per game and then the number of games than it is to think about the total number of shots of goal. But you're trading off then asking two questions instead of asking one question. And you kind of have a question budget. You've got a budget of time in which experts can respond at, at sort of their peak level of of performance. It, it sounds it sounds crazy, but it turns out to be true that experts get fatigued and when they get fatigued, they don't care anymore and they're not going to dig deep. So you've got a limited amount of time to get the best out of your experts. So you can't go asking them too many questions. It just won't work. So you trade off then between the expert fatigue and the question of how many questions you ask. And that all amounts to an expert, uh, an expert, but judgment budget. Okay, why isn't it not advancing? Advanced. There we go. Okay, so the second part of the attack path components are the blockers, the things that would impede the attack from happening. Um, and here's a couple of examples. The the exact nature of them is irrelevant, but the the graphs there capture the leakage from the node, um, mean, and meaning that. If it's high, then there is high leakage from the node, and the node does not prevent the, the attack path from happening very well. And if there's low, uh, uh, the, the low numbers uh, mean that they, they're very little leaks from the node, and therefore the attack path is, is prevented by the node. So in uh, vetting aftercare, for example, the experts held for the particular attack path, which is anonymous, uh, that vetting aftercare was not a particularly effective node, but for change of default objective permissions, the experts thought that was a very effective node. And staff internal movement control was controversial. Uh, some experts thought it was good, and some experts thought it was not good. And of course, in the discussion, you may be able to tease out some of the reasons about that. Maybe, for example, some of the experts forgot what they were answering. That can happen. But now we're looking at the aggregation or the accretion of the impeding effects across all these nodes, not just one by, not just individually, but but in aggregate. So, so what does that look like? There we go. We've got the attack path pathway attempts up the top, and we've got these node leakage diagrams in the middle, and then the outcome is down the bottom. And these are just examples, right? So if you take the top one and you multiply it by the middle ones, you're not going to get the bottom one. So don't even try. But it gives you an example of the kind of output that we get. Uh, we get the attempts at the top um, and we get the actual events at the bottom, the number of successful attacks in 100 years. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact, firstly, that it is a, a wobbly line, a density. Um, and that is capturing the uncertainty. That is the complete probabilistic model of the number of successful attacks in 100 years, according to structured expert judgment. So we've, we've accumulated all of the uncertainty that the experts reported, and we've handled it honestly and straightforwardly, and we've aggregated it to create that diagram. You'll also notice that it's really the stacking of three densities, um, a, a blue and a purple and an orange, 
And that's because we had three groups of experts. And there was reason to believe that the opinions of the expert, of the groups of experts may differ systematically. So we get a direct visual report of the different opinions of the experts from this process. And you can see that um, the blue group was more optimistic. The blue group thought that the number of pathway attempts on average, some of the members of the blue group thought that they were quite unlikely. Um, and the orange group is more pessimistic. And in fact, some of the orange group thought that the attack paths were much more likely. And our stakeholders can use what is known about the blue and orange groups to determine how they want to interpret those results. So that that's the first outcome here is we have a total, a complete probability model of the risk and also of the impacts of those different measures. So we could go further than that and we could say, well, if we were to take away, uh, for example, change of default objective permissions, that graph would be in a different place. Um, and we could figure out, therefore, what the value is of the change of default objective permissions if we can put a, uh, an impact in dollars on the pathway event, uh, which, which can be done by the same process largely or by benefit transfer or any one of any, any number of those economic black magic tools. So what we see here then is we have that the, the question is engaged with and solved, but there's more that we can do. Um, we can also support a counterfactual assessment whereby we say, well, what happens if we use vetting aftercare instead of change of default objective permissions? Does that in, in an otherwise identical attack path, does that, what outcome, kind of outcome does that lead to? And that can be analyzed quite quite closely. We have here uh, an example of a summary table um, and the, uh, the, the columns reflect the different workshops and the rows reflect different counterfactual scenarios and um, the stacked densities report against those scenarios. And we can see that the stack densities um, B and D are lower, yeah, further to the left than the stack densities A and C. And the both the B and the D uh, scenarios um, invoke a, a, a measure, an additional measure, which is a security sweep. And we can see that from the rightmost column that the security sweep reduces the number of incidents per 100 years um, from around 250 to 108, so by about, let's say, two-fifths, and, and a similar uh, comparison between C and D. So what that tells us is that um, your number of successful attempts against the objective when you invoke a security sweep reduces by about uh, two, to, to about two-fifths. And you can then answer the question, is it worth it? Uh, and of course, it, it is. So uh, I, I'm, that's not obvious from this, but I'm telling you, it is definitely worth it. So the other implications are um, that are worth thinking about. Um, this is, even though I said we can't do design, design experiments, I'm now going to complete the circle and say that we can treat this as an experimental design and you'll get better outcomes if you treat this as a, as a design experiment, this process. Uh, and um, the, in the, the elicited opinions are, are data points. Um, doing so enables us to ask important questions, such as um, when we looked at the variation that we saw there, all that variation, did that mainly come from individuals being uncertain or from individuals having different opinions? Now, we can um, we can tease that out. And if we compare the graphs on the right hand side, it's clear that the top graph has uh, significant uh, significantly less expert disagreement than the bottom graph. And that's useful intelligence um, because that tells us that <clears throat> if the variation between experts is large, that suggests that maybe a different group of experts might give you a different result. Whereas if the variation between experts is small, then that can provide some comfort that um, the expert, if they are largely in agreement, that a new clutch of experts isn't likely to disagree terribly much. Conditional, of course, on you starting with a diverse group of experts, which is a rule that I invoked earlier. And um, for the nerds among us, um, we, can, we can quantify that 
uh, as the intra class correlation. And um, the accuracy of the outcome can be improved by using weights of expert responses. This is an intuitively attractive idea. We can weight the expert responses by using some a mathematical function of uh, how well they answer questions for which we know the answer, but they may not. Um, those are called calibration questions. But remember that I was talking about earlier, I was talking about expert fatigue. Uh, when you ask calibration questions, you're asking the experts more questions. So there's a trade off again uh, between how many between the expert, the quality of the expert response and how well you can analyze the data. That's, that's a beautiful little problem. And that brings me to the conclusion uh, of my presentation. I, I um, will close by reminding you of John Tukey and exhorting you to light candles. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that. That was excellent. Uh, lots of claps coming through there. Now, I'm, I'm just going to open up and Chris, W, I might just get you to help me in case there is anything coming through in the comments side um, or put your hand up, whatever you would like. While we're waiting for any questions, Andrew, I did just have a, a quick one on um, environmental assets, if that's OK. Um, really like this approach, it was excellent. And um, how does it compare to other agencies looking to protect environmental assets? That's a great question, uh, Rich. I, I mean, the method that I sketched out is um, it, uh, it's, it's already familiar to even some people in DAF. So this is very similar to um, the import risk analysis approach that is used in um, animal by the animal uh, experts, animal division. I forget their name on the spot on the spur of the moment. Um, and I'm not sure um, how other organisations deploy that. Yeah, I, I guess it um, it depends, and it was a bit more of a, a DQ sort of uh, focus there, but. I know we've just got some questions coming through, and I think I actually here we go. I can read it now. There, so technology hasn't defeated me today. Um, this is from uh, Damien Newman. I can't see any other hands up, but Andrew, he's asked: Are there any stochastic methods to simulate the diversity of opinions by experts? That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I. I'm going to say um, I don't think there are any formal ones, but I bet we could construct some some um, informal ones pretty easily, and, and that would be a really interesting thing to do. That's a cool idea, because uh, then we could plug that into experiment, different experimental designs, and we could even think about um, an idea which we're excited about, which is uh, I'm going to nerd out briefly, incomplete randomized block designs whereby certain ex certain collections of experts don't get asked all the questions. Yep. Uh, so um, that that is to help the experts not get too fatigued and how efficient that is uh, relative to forcing all the experts to answer questions and the a kind of um, expert simulator such as suggested by the question would be a really neat device to um, to test that kind of thing. And I bet it I bet it could be parameterized as well uh, because there are huge databases of um, expert opinion experiments um, that have been constructed and that are freely available, um, mainly thanks to Professor Roger Cook, who's an absolute doyen of uh, expert elicitation uh, based in Europe. Um, it would be a really interesting thing to try to create a um an expert and and of course the other just to just to uh tease that idea a little more it'd be intriguing to see what um chat gtp or gpt would do with that kind of um question um yeah neat neat question thank you so much if i had enough monitors i would have done that concurrently while we were doing that andrew because it would have been really good thank you damien for that one that's an absolute cracker and i, I can say um I think it might have been Damien that's put it in there saying you could take percentiles on the outputs, which may help direct the questions. Um, 
I can't see any other hands up, but we have got another um, couple of questions that have come through, Andrew. So I'll just read it out. I'm sure you can see it. But um, this one's from Jody uh, Chappell. Do you see any benefit from using other methods, e.g. content and discourse analysis, to inform the later inferential statistics? Wow. Um, I, th I think that's going to be in very uh, situ context dependent. Um, but it, it it strikes me as being a really neat angle. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 that, that sounds like a really cool idea. Um, I don't know if it's been tried. Um, I, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping that at least somebody from Sebra is in the group and, and writing down all these fabulous ideas and, and also the people who asked us <laughs> what they are. Because um, we should we should check that out. That's a really cool idea. Thank you. Yeah, it is actually a good way to crowdsource, isn't it, Andrew? By uh, getting input from all the the collective brains that are in the in the audience as well. So, um, thank you, Jody. That was a a really good one. Reach Got out one. to us, Jody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get in contact. Um, Chris Rothwell, experts vary in their specific expertise. Is there waiting done to cover the focus and edges of their areas of expertise for the study? So, um, it, we we. We don't do it um, that specifically, Chris. Um, we do have the possibility of using calibration questions uh, to try to directly assess the ability of experts to answer questions, which is, of course, not only a function of their expertise, but a function of a clutch of other characteristics as well. Uh, we have found that prior opinions about expertise are particularly bad predictors of expert quality. Um, so quantities that you would ordinarily associate with authoritativeness, such as maleness and whiteness and grayness, are um, actually negatively correlated often with um, expert ability, tragically. Uh, and, and so we know that we can't use um, reputation as an indicator. So we use yeah. calibration questions ex instead to the extent that we can. Um, but they're not as fine tuned uh, to my knowledge as here's a calibration question about subject A and here's another one about subject B and we'll do separate weighting depending on where that expertise is coming from. I'm not, I'm not aware of that level of um, fastidiousness. I think all very good ideas that are, are coming through here. And yes, thank you, Jeff Purcell. We could ask chat GBT. We could. Um, seems to be theme running through there. Um, Somebody do it now. <laughs> Got time. I'm Shane. I'll get in trouble. Um, uh, and, and just in, in case, while we, if there's any other questions that are coming through, Andrew, if, if there's any opportunity here, are you able to sort of um, tell us how this work relates to any other risk analysis, if you can share, um, risk analysis approaches that Zebra has undertaken. Uh, so yes, we, it, it's similar to work that we did for um, the Office of Transport Security. Um, yep. So uh, in that, we did a project on the effectiveness of, uh, of, of explosive trace detection. Um, and people who've traveled domestically recently may have noticed that that, that um, a random number generator has been switched on in the walkthrough metal detector. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, uh, and as a consequence, um, people are now being selected randomly as they walk through the walkthrough walk metal detector instead of uh, a purposive selection. Uh, and so we did something very similar to what I've described uh, in order to try to construct a mathematical model of the process of uh, handling passengers uh, in domestic terminals uh, in order to design a system that would be more effective in, in um, achieving its outcomes, because it was generally recognized that uh, haphazard uh, or purposive selection of experts, I'm sorry, <laughs> experts, <laughs> of travelers was, um, was actually not delivering any level of warrant against the possibility of um, uh, a passenger coming through with explosives. I think that's a really good point, isn't it? Especially when, when we're looking at all, you know, the commercial flow at all airports. It's a it's a real challenge on top of the training and um, expertise that can be applied at all of those um, airports. So excellent one. Um, and thank you for sharing. One here from Peter Wilkinson. Thank you, Peter. Given the overconfidence comment, can people become good at being experts and then become highly valued 
regardless of the topic addressed? <laughs> That's an awesome question, Peter. Um, the answer is uh, yes. Um, we can, uh, experts can be trained to be less overconfident. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's still a, an issue around that there, ne there needs to be some, uh, some degree of domain expertise uh, in order to be able to invoke an expert. Um, less than we might imagine, um, but uh, uh, some, you, I, I think the rule of thumb that, that Sebra uses is if a person is able to understand all of the technical terms, and when I say understand, I mean really understand all the technical terms in the question, then their answer to it will be valuable in as as part of a diverse process. So, and that is a lower bar than many people expect when it's structured expert judgment. Um, but that actually turns out, we can demonstrate that it turns out that a, a diverse group of experts outperforms um, a smaller group of um, non-diverse experts. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter, for that question. That was really good. Uh, next one, uh, we've just got uh, a couple more minutes before we uh, we wrap up. So if you've got any more questions, get them in quickly. Um, Grant Boston, how well does the system accommodate diverse experts? For example, technical experts and traditional indigenous knowledge. <laughs> um, so that's a great question. Uh, and the answer is that the system is agnostic to where the expertise comes from. Um, yep. it, is, it is, expertise is captured by asking questions. Um, and if people can answer the questions um, by, uh, if people can answer the questions by um, uh, their knowledge, uh, then it doesn't matter to us where the knowledge comes from. Um, and we may, under certain circumstances, uh, if it's valuable, um, then where people house their expertise may be tracked and reported against, for example, using the coloured densities that I did for these different workshops, and that can be informative. And oftentimes you'll get a situation where you have um, uh, different groups of stakeholders that comprise your expertise, and um, and you, it may be valuable to track that there may be some industry representatives, there may be some governmental representatives, there may be some scientists. They may have a diversity of opinion. Um, <clears throat> it may be valuable to track that. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so shorter answer, it's agnostic to, to where the expertise comes from. Thanks, Grant, for that one. Uh, one here from uh, Mark Kethro, and he's asked, Andrew, is the Delphi technique or Delphi technique still used in expert elicitation? Um, the idea protocol is a relation to the Delphi. And uh, I, I don't know if the Delphi method is widely used otherwise. Got it. I'll just cover while Andrew's uh, having, having a cough there. But um, got a couple more questions coming in here. One from uh, Louis Suriel. Suriel? I hope I said that correctly. Um, thanks, uh, Louis. How do experts recover from um, the fatigue? Recover from fatigue? Um, how does the fatigue manifest typically? Hope that makes sense, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, experts recover from fatigue um, with the Im imbibation of copious quantities of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Or coffee, um, yeah. and the, yeah. the, the the fatigue uh, exhibits as um, they they don't think as long about the questions. They they don't, they they give up on the deep screen. Just cut off there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I I finished my sentence, but then I had to have a cough. Ah, all good. Um, uh, and look, just uh, unless I get anything else here, I've got Damien coming back over that Delphi technique to say I've always been wary of the Delphi technique. I have participated in money because the subsequent rounds felt biased. Rightly so. Do it our way. There you go. <laughs> there we go. I don't think there's any other questions, and I, I do know I've just had Chris Walk look at the, the stats, Andrew. So you, you were asking, we've had over 125 people 
um, join us today, which is excellent. So um, I'm just going to wrap it up there and just first of all pass on, um, on on behalf of all of us here at DAF and everyone that's joined in today. Um, Andrew, thank you for your time. That was excellent and elicited a lot of uh, uh, information and questions and I'm sure a lot of other opportunities coming through with these questions as well. So there'll be a lot more opportunities. So um, thank you to everyone as well for attending. We do appreciate it. Um, just flagging our next seminar, we're going to go after to the school holidays for everyone. It'll be on Thursday, 27th of April, where we'll be joined by Professor Tom Compass to discuss the value of passive surveillance and portfolio budget allocations for active surveillance. Uh, please lock that in your calendar. We'll get out to everyone shortly. So Thursday, 27th of April, that'll be our next, um, next seminar. But um, I'll close there and just thank Andrew once again. Excellent presentation and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.